Praise God. Well, look, uh, yeah, so, I mean, we sing a couple of songs about the king. The last two songs were about kings. And uh, I'm going to just use that to kind of transition into the message tonight. That, you know, one of the things that I think about <clears throat> when I think of a king is that they have a decree. You know, there's a, in the old days, they would have a herald. And a herald was a person that was called by the king to proclaim uh, a decree uh, in, his, in the king's kingdom. And if you've ever watched older movies, you might have seen something like that where they walk up with the scroll, right? And they'd say, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. And they would, they, they would, they, they would and everybody would get st snapped to attention because when the king talks, the citizens listen, amen? They're supposed to listen to what, to what the king has to say or else sometimes you get in trouble, right? Uh, well, a lot of times you'll get in trouble if you don't listen to what the king has to say. And so transitioning from that, you know, I didn't really give my message a title tonight, but I think that if I was, I was thinking about it, and I think it was a, it'd be a question, do you have faith in the word? I didn't ask you if you were of the word of faith, I asked you if you have faith in the word, amen? And, and, and I want you, and that's why I wanted to say that about a decree, because I believe it's so imperative and important for you and I not to just pick and choose pieces of scripture that we hold on to, that we're going to believe in, but that we would avail ourselves to the whole of God's word, and that when we approach God's word, we would approach it as though it is the literal word of God. And that's, and I believe that there's a great blessing in that, that when we view God's word as though it is his word, praise God, that he will bless us as we not only learn it and listen, but that we surrender to it, amen, and begin to ask him to help us to live it out, praise God. And so... Uh, I want you to, in this first passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 55, uh, verses 8 through 11, I'm just going to go ahead and read this uh, because it's talking about the word of God. This is not really, I'm not preaching on the word of God, but I wanted to start off with some concepts about the word of God. And I wanted to really hammer the point home on the importance of believing God's word to be people that have faith in the word of God. Amen. And Isaiah says this, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then he starts talking about the rain. He talks about how the rain and the snow, that they come down from heaven and that they don't return there. Now, some people nowadays in modern science might say, well, you know, there's a concept of, you know, condensation and then evaporation and then with the heat. But this is the point God's making. Nothing returns back to heaven without accomplishing it. The condensation that comes down on the earth does not return to heaven without accomplishing its intended purpose. God has an intended purpose for precipitation to fall upon the physical earth. And his purpose for that precipitation to come upon the earth is that it would bring life to the seed of the sower. That's what it says right there in verse 10, that it brings forth bud, that the grain flowers, amen, that the food of the harvest flowers, and that there's a point for that, that what it does is it accomplishes the life in the grain, if you will, and it makes bread for the eater. God's got a purpose for water that comes down and waters the earth, amen, that there would be bread for the eater and the physical. But what I need you to know is that the Lord says, so shall my word be in verse 11. So shall the, my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please, amen. God says, and it's going to prosper in the thing whereto I send it. See, God's word is going to accomplish his will. It's going to accomplish its intended purpose. When the word of the Lord goes forth and people treat it for what it is, the word of God, it has an effect in the hearts and lives of people. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, with, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You know what was interesting is that in the Hebrew, it, when it's talking about that it, it shall accomplish, 
that which it, 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 that it would perform its intended results, that the idea behind it in the, in the Hebrew, when you look at it, has the word success connected to it. God's word has success, but also in the Greek where it says effectually has the idea of that also success. It, it has an effect. God's word has an effect. Amen. Uh, how many stories have you heard of people that did that started off not even really serving the Lord, but yet they started reading the word of God and the word of God ended up having an effect in their life and that their whole life was transformed. I guarantee you there are testimonies in this place right now that if I ask people to give testimonies, each probably so many of y'all could give a testimony of what the word of God has done in your heart, in your life. I know that there's at least a couple of people in here that it's been huge that God has spoken to people about scriptures and, and that he drove it in their heart and that it caused a miracle to take place on the inside like a seed that brings forth life is exactly what the word of God will do. Amen. So that's why I started with some scriptures about the word of God. Because I wanted to establish the importance and I wanted us to establish the fact that it is the living word of God. That we don't approach the Bible, or at least I don't, and people that are, you know, that should be part of this church. I need you to understand at least my position. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I know my position is that it is the literal word of God. And that we can't pick and choose pieces of it that we want to believe. There's, there may be times that we don't always understand it, but what we should be doing is we should ask God to give us wisdom and understanding. It says in the book of James that if we, if we need wisdom, that if we will ask him, he won't chastise us. He won't upbraid us for that. Amen. Amen. He'll, he'll, he will give us wisdom because he wants us to have it. Amen. Because he wants to help us. God's a good God and he wants to, he wants to help us. Amen. All right. So. I put, uh, uh, I put this in my notes that a sinful lifestyle is not normal Christianity. And that's what I want to talk to you about really tonight. I want to talk to you about freedom through the word of God. Okay. Through understanding the word of God. Okay. And, and I want you to know that a sinful, an ongoing sinful lifestyle is not normal Christianity. Normal Christianity is victory. Normal Christianity is power from the Holy Ghost that infuses you, infills you, and strengthens you with the power of God that you and I could live in victory over the power of sin. That is normal Christianity, according to what the Word of God says. So let's look at a couple of scriptures. It says right here, 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Now, the idea there is that it's a present tense continuous, meaning that you're gonna that you're that the, whoever has been born of God does not continue to live a lifestyle of sin. And the reason why that happens is is because the seed of God remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. You know, look when a true conversion takes place, the convert cannot continue to live a lifestyle of sin and the seed of God remain in him. At some point in time, listen, I don't believe in once saved, always saved. At the same time, I will say this. I can tell you one thing. God's not looking to leave. God, whenever God shows up in, a, in your heart, listen, he's looking to stay. God, the Father, is so committed to a relationship with you, amen, that he did. He bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. He sent us Jesus. He's not looking for a reason to leave. The reason I want to say that is this. The, the enemy will, will, will try to convince people when, when they do have a struggle in their life that they're unworthy. He will try to condemn them and make them feel as though they're unworthy. And I'm here to tell you that he's a liar. He's a liar and he's the father of lies. And the Lord is not looking for a reason to leave. The Lord is wanting to stay. And he promises in his word that if we will trust him and continue to follow after him, that he will give us victory. And so the seed of God, whoever is really born of God, the seed of God is in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So the seed of God, which is Christ, which is the Christ, Jesus, has been born of on the inside of a true convert's 
hard in life. When I say a true convert, I'm, I'm trying to say that there's a lot of people that have prayed a prayer. Yeah, that's right. A lot don't know what that was, and you probably don't want to go looking because you never know. But I will tell you this, that a true convert, there's a lot of people that have prayed a prayer at some point in time in their life. They've been, they've been encouraged to pray a prayer. I'm all about people praying prayers. But just because you prayed a prayer does not mean that a true conversion took place. I know we've talked about that recently. I don't mean to overdo it. But when a true conversion takes place, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of that human vessel. And it changes everything. And listen to me. You're not going to be the same after you're converted to the Lord as what you were before you were converted to the Lord. If you if, look, look if, whenever the Holy Spirit moves in, if you weren't if you were converted before whatever church you went to, if they're not feeding you the truth of God's word, you're not going to be okay with that. You cannot remain okay in a situation where the word of God is not going forth, where the truth is not going forth, and continue to thrive and to continue to grow. In your walk with God, it's not going to happen. It's impossible. The, the Spirit of God is craving a deeper walk with you, a deeper relationship with you. The Spirit, it says it. The Spirit of God, listen, this is King James, lusteth to envy. What? The Spirit lust? Yes, because see the word lust, epithumia, actually describes a desire or craving for something either good or something bad, depending on the context. The Holy Spirit has a craving and a desire for a deeper walk with you, for a closer relationship with you. That's why if you are a true convert, the seed of God now lives on the inside of you. Complacency is not the norm. God's not okay with you and I being complacent. We just get a little bit here and there. No, he wants you and I to be on fire for God. Amen. Look. I'm telling you right now, I, I, I talked about it in my message. But listen, this is the word of God. This is not Matt Abair talking to you right now. Um, last Sunday, whenever I preached that message, God is looking for a body that he can put his head on a set of shoulders. That he can, that he can lead and guide a, set, a pair of feet to go, not just preachers. Not just the pastor, but that he can lead and guide a pair of feet to go to a place where he'll call them to go. That he can, if somebody's hurt and sick and, and they're infirm, that they would believe the written word of God. And that through their hands, laying hands on the sick, they shall recover. God wants people to have faith and to believe. God wants a set of hands that's willing to strum a guitar like the psalmist David. God put, gave you lips. Brothers and sisters, he put breath in your lungs so that you could glorify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I know you're tired. I know I say that a lot. I'm tired too. And I'm also tired of the devil trying to steal my joy, trying to steal my praise. Jesus is worthy to receive glory and honor. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, I got to breathe. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yes. God wants you with him. He's not trying to get rid of you. Amen. And he wants communion with you. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. So look, if you've been born of God, it's not normal Christianity that would keep living in that type of a lifestyle. And so the devil been lying to you. If you feel like you can't get free, I want you to know tonight that's a lie. Because you're already free. Oh, I said it. I said it. You're already free. Amen. Look. The Lord, I know I told y'all that the Lord been giving me these visuals. This one was a while back. I've already said it to the church, but it's just, the Lord just prompted me again. I can remember that I was over here praying, like right here up at the front, and then all of a sudden I saw it was people were dressed in regular street clothes, but I could tell they were behind walls in a prison setting. And they were just walking around, and it was, you know, once it was all said and done, I know what the Lord spoke to me. It was believers. It was people. And they were all just meandering around like on the yard inside of a prison, behind the prison walls and then all of a sudden one person broke away from the crowd and he walked up to the door and he just put he just turned him up and he opened the door and the door the door was open it was unlocked <laughs> I just thought of something else and the door was unlocked and he walked out and everybody started to walk out and they were like hey, we're free we're free and then what the Holy Spirit was showing me through that was that so many times God's people don't realize that they are already free because Jesus said it is finished.
listen, the power of the devil has been broken in the name of Jesus. Now, on an illustrative side note, we went to the jailhouse on Christmas Eve. I just thought of this. The guy, I saw Robert's face. Me, him, and Aaron. And I said, hey, Aaron, you want, why don't you go ahead and preach the word? Huh? All right. So me and Robert were sitting there, and Aaron was preaching about Abraham and preaching about his son Isaac and how the Lord provided a sacrifice and he's Jehovah Jireh, amen, and how, how Paul related that, that, you know, in the New Testament. And then, I don't know, I, I said a little something and then Robert said a little something and then the next thing you know, we started praying. We, and so one of the guys was off to a little further down. He just stayed up in the rack. We didn't really mess with him because the other two guys were like right there. And then all of a sudden, uh, Robert heard some sniffling going on over there. And so Robert walked over there and the dude that was in the rack had got and just tears were just streaming down his face. Long story short, Aaron knew that guy, me and Aaron ended up going to his daddy's house to tell him that, you know, that the Lord had touched him. But but this is the thing. I was praying and, and this was funny. Robert thought I got a kick out of it. You might get a kick out of it too. I was like, Lord, just like Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail, late in the midnight hour, Lord, I pray that you'd open up these doors, these prison doors, open up these prison doors and spiritually set these brothers free. Because look, when I, I'm telling you, we had all Holy Ghost in there, and they were all weeping, and the Lord was moving, and then all of a sudden, the dude right there on the left, he kind of jingled the chain a little bit, next thing you know, he opens up the door, and he walks out, and I'm like, hallelujah, dude, you just about to walk, he put his hat on, he said, I said, you about to just walk out of this mug, he said, yeah, I gotta go to work, <laughs> and Robert thought that was so funny, praise God, he was a trustee, he had some work to do. Hey man, it's kind of like, you know, Barney Fife jail, you know, like you just open up the door and you just walk out. But anyway, I'm believing God that their spiritual prison door were open. Hey amen. God, God's going to do a work. Hey amen. Praise God. Well, look, so the seed of God's been born in you. Look at 2 Peter 1 4. And I want you to know this because, see, this is why it's not normal Christianity. Look what it says Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. You see that? You might be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Escaped. That goes perfect with the little the illustration. Like in other words, like you were you were in prison. When you were born of Adam, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more, I'm pretty sure. But when you were born of Adam, you were born in sin in the natural. And you were born in bondage, in a spiritual prison. Sometimes people are like, well, I, don't have, I didn't have the problems you had. Well, praise the Lord. But do you know how many people deal with things like a spirit of depression? How many people deal, and people in churches... Dealing with a spirit of depression and not really being free. Amen. And other things in their life. I'm here to tell you the Lord wants his people free. And so through the born again experience, the divine nature has, has been implanted on the inside of us. Because you see, the Holy Spirit now lives on the inside of us because of what Jesus did for us at the cross. And because of that, we have been given the ability to have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Listen, if, if you're anything like me, if you look wherever you are today, if you'll look backwards, where you were a year ago, five, ten years ago, twenty years ago, thirty years ago, depending on how long you've been saved, and you look backwards sometime, and you look, look, Christmas Eve, I went to go visit my sister after church, and she pulled out a photo album that she had found when I was little, and tucked away in there was a Polaroid. And I'm just like, oh my gosh. Lord, thank you. Yes. Thank you for saving me. Amen. I was so lost. I was, I was so bound. I had no hope. I had, but no, there's always hope, my oh, friend. That's why we got to be about our father's business. Yes. And I don't mean to keep telling the story, but my sister Kathy, she sits in the back back there. Y'all might not know. But uh, I, I told Debbie. Debbie didn't even remember the whole story. I said, girl, I've been telling your testimony for the last 10 years. I mean, I've heard it, and I've never forgot it. 
Because you see, this is the way that the gospel moves forward. If you'll remember in the gospel of John, the Bible says that, that, that the two disciples, which would have been actually Andrew, Peter's brother, and John the Beloved, were actually disciples of John the Baptist. And whenever John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, when they heard that, the Bible says that they disconnected from John the Baptist and they connected themselves to Jesus. And then the next thing you know, Andrew went and found Peter and said, we found him, the one we've been waiting on. And then the next thing you know, they're up in Galilee and they found Philip because they were friends with Philip because he was a fisherman. And the next thing you know, they find Nathaniel up under a fig tree. And the point that I'm trying to make is this. This is how the gospel's been being spread. And so my sister Kathy back there, she, one night there was a, a story. Uh, well, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but there was, a, there was a reason that they went over there to their house. Well, I mean, it is what it is. I'll tell Danielle to pull it out. She, she'll, she'll, get upset. she'll get upset with me, but then she don't like having to go backwards. But basically, uh, they were going to smoke some marijuana back in them days. You know, it's not, it's not like I never smoked that stuff. It's, I thank God I'm not proud of that. But anyway, that's what was going to happen. They were going to go over there, and then, and then I, and my understanding is, is that there was a little bit of a joke because somebody had gotten saved. Kathy had gotten saved, and it was kind of funny, and it was a good thing that you could laugh at. And so anyway, my sister goes over there and, and she's over there pouring out her problems, right? She's got some stuff going on with the in-laws and things of that nature. And then the next thing you know, Kathy turns around and she grabs a Bible behind her and she says, did I tell you that I'm not of that religious persuasion? I'm going to just say it like that tonight. I'm not of that religious persuasion that I used to be. I'm, I got born again. And I think she started to talk to her about John chapter 3. About being born again. Yeah. And then the next thing you know, my sister comes to my house. And I've told y'all that story. That's how it happened. My sister comes to my house when I'm 13 years old. And she's talking about Jesus in a way like I ain't never heard before. Yeah. And all I'm trying to say is this. Is that that's the good news. There's always hope. And that whenever, if you look backwards on your life. And you realize what God has done in your life. Amen. And, and, and listen, and if you'll let that seed grow, God will use you in other people's lives. And I want you to know how important that is. Because, because do you realize how many Christians are going to stand before the Lord and, 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 and not really have any rewards that last? The scripture is clear. That, that there's going to be people that make it in, but they're not going to have any rewards. Because their rewards were good, are going to be burnt up in the fire. I don't know who they are. You don't necessarily know who they are. I know one thing. I don't want to be one of them. I know one thing. I want to be about my father's business, doing the work of the Lord. I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be living my life for myself. I want to be living my life for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? All right. One of the precious promises that he's given us, again, is that we would be partakers of the divine nature. And when the divine nature is on the inside of you, once again, it's not normal for us to live and continue life of sin. But what is normal is that we get excited about the things of God and we tell other people about what God has done in our life. And I'll tell you something else. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit in this church. Right. We believe in being infilled and poured out upon and, and that the Holy Spirit will fill you up and flow out of you and out of your bellies will flow the rivers of living water. Amen. And that, that it will empower you to be a witness for the kingdom of God. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And you need to seek that if you don't have that. You need to cry out to the Lord. Amen. And say, Lord, fill me up. Praise God. And, and we need to believe God. Amen. We need to come to the altars and to, and to let, get, let people lay hands on us and to pray that we would be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That we would speak with other tongues. Amen. That you would receive your prayer language. Amen. And that you would be even closer to the Lord than what you are now. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right. So you've been implanted with a divine nature. All right. I want you to see this. Romans chapter 6 verse 3. Because we're talking about victory in Christ tonight. It says, uh, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time with this scripture. All right. But what I did want to say is this, is that the idea of uh, know you not, that's actually how we started. You know, Robert and I, uh, the Lord used us to start a Bible study. And the name of our Bible study was Agna Eo Bible Study. In the Greek, that's what those words mean, know you not. It means Agna Eo. The idea is, did you not know? 
were you ignorant? So then when the apostle Paul says, did you not know? You know, and the word ignorant is not a bad thing. It just means sometimes you just don't, you just don't know. Nobody has ever told you. And so the apostle Paul is asking the question, were you not aware of this? Aware of what, Paul? That, that those of you who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, I'm not really, my plan is not to really dig too deep on this, but it just, I'm just going to say something, that the word water is not in the Greek text right here. Many times when we hear the word baptized in English, we automatically either think of water baptism or Holy Spirit baptism. But you have to understand that there's another baptism. By one spirit, you were baptized into one body. I'm not going to really, well, let me just go ahead and say this. There's three baptisms, at least three baptisms. There's probably more. But specifically speaking, you have the, whenever the, it's the first, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. By one spirit, you were baptized into one body. When you become a believer, whenever you hear the word of truth and you are converted immediately at that moment, whether you realized it or not, when you are truly born again, when you're really converted, the Holy Spirit takes you and baptizes you into the person of the Christ. You become a new creation. I mean, long before you ever went down in the water, maybe, right? You become a new creation. Something happened on the inside. That's why a doctrine that teaches you must be baptized in a specific tank of water, a specific way, and that you must speak in No, 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 no. That's not how you're born again. Conversion takes place at the moment that you truly believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. And when that happens, the person of the Holy Spirit takes you and baptizes you into the person of Jesus and in the mind of God, the old man that you were that was born in the natural of Adam, born into sin, dies with Jesus on the cross, is buried with Jesus in the tomb, and hallelujah, just as he was raised from the dead, you too should walk in newness of life. You didn't have to know all that to get saved, but I'm here to tell you tonight, that's what happened to you, because in order to grow in Christ, in order to walk in victory, you need to be aware of the methods of the devil, and you need to be aware of the truth of God so that you won't fall for his lies. Come on. So that's the person of the Holy Spirit. He baptizes you into the person of the Christ. John the Baptist said, there's one that comes after me. I, I'm not worthy to even to latch lat his sandal. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus is baptizing, hallelujah, people into the Holy Spirit, and they receive that baptism of fire with the Holy Spirit. Different person doing the baptizing, baptizing into a different person of, of the Godhead. Amen? Amen? And then you got a pastor or a brother, sister, whoever, and you don't have to have a credential to baptize somebody in water. Amen? You don't have to have a credential. No, I'm not going to shrink back from that. You just got to be a born-again believer that believes in the Word of God and believes, hey, what, what prevents me from being baptized right now? Nothing. They got a, they got a water hole right here. We can get you wet. Amen? You, you just got to be saved. You got to be saved, and that's your outward profession of your faith. So it's already happened. The thief on the cross is already saved. Amen? But before he, and he goes to meet Jesus in paradise. But look, when you go down in the water, so now you got a, a one human being baptizing another human being into water. Anyway, I didn't plan on getting into all that, but I wanted to make this point that when we see the word baptized, we automatically usually think water baptism. I'm here to tell you, I believe this is talking about when you're baptized into Christ. Because if you read the whole chapter of chapter 6, what you begin to realize is that it's talking about freedom and it's talking about liberty and it's talking about the power of sin being broken in water. Don't do that, friend. The blood of Jesus does that. The cross of Jesus Christ does that. Amen. It breaks the power of sin. All right. The word gives us revelation so that we don't have to be ignorant anymore. Now, I wanted, I wanted to, but I'm going to go back to finish up some of these passages in Romans 6. But before we do that, I wanted to go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 23. I want to encourage you to understand that when you were converted, when you were regenerated, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says that. The washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. When you received a true regeneration, you are not the same person. Mm -hmm. And maybe you needed somebody to let you know that tonight. Maybe you've been struggling with some things. But I'm here to tell you it's so important that you understand that. Yeah. 
Because y'all and I, we ought to not keep falling into the same old traps. We need to understand who we are in Christ, who Christ is in us, and that we have a new identity. Amen? And we have a new identity. And we have the power of God living on the inside of us. All right, look at this. Ephesians 4, 22 through 23. That you put off concerning the former conversation. I, I put on the side here the NASB version too. You don't have to switch to it. I just want to say that, that in reference to your former manner of life, that word conversation is really outdated in the King James language. It's talking about the way you live your life. Okay? He says that you put away that your, your former manner of life you, concerning the former manner of life, the old man. Yeah. Now, who's the old man? He, the old man is the one that was born in natural birth from Adam. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. The way a person is born again is not through a ritual a per, a per, not, and not as a child. I mean, a child that's old enough to understand, yes. But no, a true born again experience takes place when a person believes with their heart and confesses with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever that happens and the Holy Spirit moves in, so again, not believing with their head, but believing with their heart. And when the Holy Spirit moves in, that's when you know, all right? But now, so that's what it means to be born again, right? So the first time you were born, you were born the old man in natural birth of Adam. He was corrupt according to deceitful lusts, but that we should be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Now, what I wanted to do is I wanted to bring you back to put off. I'm not trying to get all technical on you. Just, just listen to the concept. You don't have to remember the, the idea in the Greek. But like if you had, let's just say this is your old man, okay? This is your old man. And, and in the Greek, it's in the middle voice. What does that mean? It, the, the active voice, the passive voice, and the middle voice. It has to do with how the verb's <coughs> action affects the noun or the subject in the sentence, okay? So he's talking to believers, and he's encouraging them that they would put off, according to their former man manner of life, the old man. So if the voice was active, then, then that means that they would be basically doing all the work. The, you, know, you get what I'm saying? The subject would be doing all the action of the verb, and that he would be the one putting off. It was his victory. That would be something kind of like New Age, right? I got the victory. I got the victory. I got the power on the inside of me. I'm not going to say anything more because somebody, not that I'm that popular. They're probably going to waste their time on me. But they'll clip it. And they'll say, look at this guy. He's preaching New Age. I'm not going to say the rest of it. But what I am going to say is this. That would be the active voice. That you would pretend that you did all the work and you put off the old man. Right. The passive voice would be, you know, uh, okay, Micah, we're not in the camera. Would you come do me a favor and just kind of like pull this off of me real quick? So now I'm the subject, and what's happening is, is that I'm just completely passive. I didn't have anything to do with it. Micah came over there, thank you, sis, and she did all the work. Okay, and that would be kind of like the idea would be is that if God did all the work and this was written in the passive voice, you don't have nothing to do with it, brothers and sisters. You ain't got nothing to worry about. No, 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 no. The Lord's going to do it. Well, look, hold on a second. No, but it's, it's in the middle voice. That means that, that the subject is being both acted upon and he has action inside of the sentence. So what that means is, is that God has done the work. Jesus said, it is finished. The work is complete. The door is unlocked. But dude in the prison got to walk up to the door. He got to turn the knob. He got to open it up. And he's got to walk out. And he's got to put off the old man that Jesus has already crucified. You can't keep putting him on. Come on. But I like this. I like, I think, I don't like, look, I didn't like all that other stuff that was really ruining my life and took all my money out of my checkbook, but I like this other stuff. I don't want to, no, 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 If it's the old man, you got to get rid of it. The Lord is not okay with Jesus had to die on the cross, naked on the cross, to fulfill the Father's will. And listen, to him that knows to do right, doesn't do it to him in his sin. I'm sorry if that seems like, no, 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 that ain't sorry about nothing. That's the word of God. Yeah. It's time for us to put off the old man who was corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Listen, lust is so deceitful, my friend. And what, look, once you open the door to it, help us. 
Help us, Lord. Because, see, when you open the door to something that is ungodly, what happens is, is that what floods in is, is deceit. Yes. Connected to sin is deceit. Yes. So where you can't see it. And you hope and pray that you have friends in the body of Christ, that you would open up your heart to the truth of God's word, that if you, and, and that you would listen. If somebody in your church, listen, as a pastor, I can tell you right now, sometimes I have conversations with people, and they say something, I'm like, I might not even agree at first, but I'm going to be honest with you. I do not want to have an unteachable spirit. I want my heart to be right. I'm going to bring it to the Lord, and I'm going to bring it, I'm going to get on my knees and on my face. And sometimes we don't even like the way stuff sounds when it first comes out. But I'm going to tell you right now, I want my heart to be right before the Lord. Amen? And I don't want to be deceived. I'm done wasting time, wasting God's time. I'm done being, I don't want to be deceived. I've been deceived as a, as, a, as, a, as a worldling, as an earthling. I've been deceived as a believer. I've been deceived as a pastor. I don't want to live a life of deception. I want to live a life of revelation. Amen? And so he says what? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Look, we've been talking about this a lot lately, but when you get saved, when you get born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your spirit. But a lot of times we don't understand who we are in Christ, like I said earlier, or who Christ is in us. That's why the word of God is so important. We need the word of God to have its way and to have its effect on our mind, right? And that we would begin to see the word of God the way God sees the word, that we would begin to respond to God's truth, amen? Praise God. And the word of God is nourishment that helps us grow spiritually. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. And I mean, you don't even have to turn there. It's quick. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. But you cannot get enough of the word of God. Look, a baby. I know that. Listen, I don't think you should look at this scripture the same way when Paul said, I would give you, I would feed you milk, meat, but you're not ready. That, that was, I think that's a different context. That's just my personal opinion. Like, I don't think that Peter's trying to say that y'all babies and that y'all grow milk. He, it's an illustration. As a baby craves milk for growth, a believer should be craving the word of God for continued growth. Amen. You cannot grow in Christ without the help of God's written word. Yeah. Amen? Thank God for the, look, man, I'm telling you, we got another prophetic class, the 18th, we said, Thank God for prophetic words. Thank God for the whisper of the Holy Spirit when he speaks to us. You cannot replace the written word of God. Jesus said, it is written. Listen, in the beginning, in the garden, they disobeyed the spoken word of God. But then the enemy tries to come pulling the same old tricks and the same old tactics to Jesus in the wilderness. And Jesus said, it is written, Satan. Get behind me. I rebuke you, Satan. It is written, right? And listen, you can't get past the written word of God. But, but, but look, he wants us to grow. Okay, you get that point. All right, we're going back to Romans chapter 6. Going back to verses 5 through 7. Where it says this. It says, if we have, verse 5, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. So I already preached it, but now we're going to read it. Okay? What did I say? When you get saved, when, you, when true regeneration takes place, the person of the Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into the person of Christ. Right? And in God's mind, this is what I want you to see. This is so important. If you've, if you've been struggling with something, okay, and if, and if you know it already and you're still struggling, then, then you know what that means is it means that we have a surrender problem. I mean, it, because the word of God says you're free. So if you have a revelation of it, now you may not have a complete revelation because, look, you can understand something intellectually, but it, but it may not mean that you've received the revelation of it yet. Does that make sense? Where the, where the light has really been turned on in your spirit, man. And that may be what it is. But if you feel like you've been going around saying that you have a revelation, this goes, this is good for the preacher too, okay? If you feel like you've been going around saying you have a revelation, but yet at the same time, you still struggle with it, it's a possibility that you haven't surrendered. Amen. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to be willing to surrender. And that goes back to yoking yourself to Christ and, you know, lowering yourself in his presence. All right. So it says, it, it, but what, what I want you to see is that in the mind of God, this is what happened when you got saved. I need you to understand that when the father looks at you, if you're truly saved, he sees you as having been planted together in the likeness of Jesus's death and that you would also be a partaker in the likeness of his resurrection. 
and that you would know this, that your old man, who was born in the natural of Adam, has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. It's important. I don't have time to really break this down. Many of you already know it. But what we're talking about there now, we're talking about the sinful nature. You received a sinful nature in your first birth in Adam. When God created Adam and from the earth, the earth was not fallen. Adam was created in the image and likeness of God. But when Adam fell, he received a sinful nature. And now all of his offspring have received a sinful nature. But, but when you get born again, it's not that the sinful nature is eradicated, but it's supposed to be dormant. The relationship between the believer and sin is not supposed to be active. The old man has been crucified. A new man has been resurrected. You're not supposed to be partaking of the sinful nature. You're supposed to be partaking of the divine nature. So we should be free to not have to serve sin, right? Because he that is dead is free from sin. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of resurrection. And, and that which died in Christ, amen, is resurrected to newness of life. The same spirit that raised him up, amen? Resurrection life through the spirit. Not just for a glorified body tomorrow, but for victorious life today. The man, the old man is crucified with Jesus and the body of sin or the power of the sinful nature is destroyed because it has no power over the new man. I want to make that point. So, so sometimes the problem, the, sometimes the problem that we have is, is that we don't understand what's happening to us when the enemy attacks us with his lies because we don't understand the word of God. And we're not, we're, we're, we have not been properly equipped with the word of God to, pre to be prepared for the enemy to come in with his deceptive tactics. And then even when we are properly equipped, again, we have a surrender problem sometimes. And I mean, that's just, we see that in, in people's lives. Amen. But, the, but, the, but that power of sin was broken. Amen. It had, the, the power of sin had power over the old man, but that's not who we are. We're not the old man anymore. We're new creations in Christ Jesus if we are truly saved. Amen. And that's what we're trying to talk about tonight is the power of the word of God and what the word of God says. And what the word of God says when a person is truly born again and that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of them. And what how God sees the new the convert the new convert. How God sees the born again believer. And he sees them as their old man being dead and done away with. Amen. And he's laying the old man's laying in the tomb and the new man, and that's the love of God. That is the love of God manifest. Now, this is the thing. Look, because the brother made a comment about the love. I'm all about the love of God. But but look, let me just say this. And, let me, and I, this, I don't think this is what you're talking about. But there's also a move in the modern church where love now is ooshy gushy. Oh, yeah. Ooey gooey. Yeah. Okay? Like a, like a sticky bun. Like a honey bun. No, no, no. That's not the love of God. You know? No, the love of God is revealed to us in the love of Jesus. Jesus said the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. That is the love of God. The love of God. And then you experience it when the same heart of Jesus is put on the inside of your chest. And when you quit, when, when the Holy Spirit starts to have its way and he starts to crucify your flesh and yourself starts to die. And it's not just all about you, but instead it becomes about him. And it becomes about his will for the kingdom of God. Amen. And, and listen, if we stay close to the Lord and the Holy Spirit has his way, he'll begin to bring, in, bring conviction in our hearts. Whenever we are allowing ourselves to be puffed up because of too much knowledge. That's what it says. The, not, too much knowledge will puff you up. And I know what that I know what that looks like because I've experienced it. I thought I was the only one that knew anything. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Okay? The enemy wants to make us believe that we're the ones that got all the answers. We got some answers because the answers are in the book. But look, the Lord wants that self to die. And we cannot experience true love. You know what the word of God says about love? First John chapter 3, verse 1. He says, What manner of love is this? 
that God has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Listen, our understanding of the love of God is so foreign because let me tell you, God's love is so foreign to the earthly realm that we live in. I don't care how much you love the Lord, how much you know about the word of God, how much you think you love like God loves, we are still, even the closer we get to the love of God, we are still so far away from the love of God. Lord, help us because we need self to die in order for the love of God to even closely be manifest in our lives. And as soon as we think we got it, come on, we might need to come back down and get on our knees again and start all over again because as soon as we think we got something figured out, then that's what knowledge will do. It'll puff you up. But I want to have knowledge with love. And I want to have zeal with knowledge. I want to be fire on, the, on fire for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and for the Word of God. For, to exalt Jesus. I want to do the work of the Lord. I want, to, I, want, I want God to do a work in me to where I will selflessly serve. Yes. That no matter what happens to me. No matter how people treat me. No matter what people think about me. That I will still get up tomorrow morning. And I'll put my... I'll put my clothes on and I'll still serve God. Amen. Till, till there ain't nothing left to give. Till it's all left. Because that's what he did for me. Amen. That's what the love of God tells him. He left it all on the field for me. He, like, you know, that was just a, a euphemism that dad would have said. Leave it all on the field. Leave, leave it all on the battlefield. I want to leave it all. Amen. All right. So this two things went longer than I expected, but it's okay. I want to, I want to just give you two more verses because I want to say, look. Romans 4, 3, it says this. For what says the scripture? This is what the scripture says. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. See, I started this off by talking about the word of God and the importance of the word of God and how important it is for us to believe the word of God. See, in God's mind, when people believe him at his word, he, he counts it as righteousness. Okay, and he says right here, Abraham believed God. Now, I was talking about the plan of salvation because God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, and to offer him on a mountain. Amen. But look, Abraham believed God. And if you looked at it in the Greek, the idea is, is that God put righteousness in Abraham's account. So when you and I believe God at his word, he credits our account with righteousness. It's not by, work, by works of righteousness that we have done. No, it's the, it's the work of the Lord. Amen. Praise God. And so I wanted you to, to see this, too, is that is Romans chapter 5, verse 17. If by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So what I wanted you to see there is this. Abraham believed God and God gave him, credited him for righteousness. And what this scripture says is that Adam's offense resulted in death reigning like a king, right? That's what reign means. It means like a king by the one act of disobedience. But much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. See, I wanted, wanted you to see there is that grace flows through the gift of righteousness. Yeah. Jesus gave us the gift of righteousness. Jesus died on the cross. And a great exchange took place. You, th do you understand? Listen, I'm going to be careful that I choose my words right. But, but I want you to know this. That do you understand that righteousness is such a huge part of this whole thing? You, you and I are not going to enter into the kingdom of God without the righteousness of God. That's right. And the righteousness of God was a person. That's right. Romans chapter 3 verse 21. His name is Jesus. And God allowed him to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and a great exchange took place on the cross. He took your guilt. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He took your guilt and he gave you the gift of his righteousness. And without righteousness and holiness, no man will see the Lord. But what I want you to see here is this, is that you receive abundance of grace of the, of that, that's of the free gift of righteousness. So now that you believe God and God credited your account with righteousness, yeah. because, and it's a gift given to us by Jesus and what he did for us at the cross, mm -hmm. what, what I want you to understand is this, is that grace flows in that. Mm -hmm. That's what I want you to see. Grace flows to the position of righteousness. 
Okay. Jesus made you righteous, and because you're righteous, grace can flow into your life. Grace is what you need. Grace is what you need so that you can love. Grace is what you need so that you don't fall. Grace is what you need whenever you do fall, that you get picked back up again. But I need you to understand, I used to say this all the time, I don't say it too much anymore. Grace is not sloppy grace. Grace is not a Britney Spears song back in the whatever it was. Oops, I did it again. And like it's not a big deal. That's not what grace is. Great, the definition of grace in the middle of the definition is this. It's a divine influence on the heart. That means a God thing. God does something on your heart, on your insides. It's a divine, a godly influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. When the grace of God enters in and starts changing things around, the bondages of sin start to be broken in the name of Jesus. And it's done because of what Jesus did on the cross. Whenever the grace of God starts to flow in the heart and life of a person, the love of God begins to manifest in their lives. When the grace of God starts to flow in a person's life, if they fell away, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let's understand that. In order to come back, the conviction of the Holy Spirit got to get a hold of our hearts. And we have to repent. We have to repent. And what does that mean? It means to turn from our sinful ways and to turn back to God. Amen. And it's a beautiful experience where the grace of God ministers into our heart and our lives. Amen. Praise God. So who gets the grace? I got. I have some questions for you real quick. I'm about to close, I promise. Who gets the grace? The righteous get the grace, right? How did they get it? It was a gift, right? From Jesus. You know, you need, look, see, Christmas just left. Okay, and you got some gifts. I'm guessing you got a gift, okay? I got a couple of little gifts. And guess what? They were free to me, but they cost somebody something, right? Somebody had to pay the money. And that's the same thing that happened with the gift of righteousness. It's free gift given to you, but it wasn't free to Jesus. Jesus paid for that gift with his precious blood. Amen. And so it's a gift that was paid for by Jesus. So who gets the grace? The righteous get the grace. And, and how did they get it? It was a gift. And so everybody gets it. No, it's available to everyone. It's available, but only those that believe God at his word get it. It goes back to the illustration of the ATM, right? Y'all heard me talk about that more than once. That you're going to have money in an account waiting for you to go get it. You even have the PIN number because the PIN number is your faith. But you got to get yourself in the car. You got to drive over there. You got to punch the PIN in and you got to take your withdrawal. And if, and if a man refuses to drive himself to the ATM of God, if you will, and to exhibit faith in what God's plan was, then he cannot receive his withdrawal. And so that, and that's the love of God. The, the love of God is that he also gave us a free will. And if man chooses not to go the way of God, God will allow it. All right, this is what I'm closing with. Romans 6, 11. In the King James Version, it says this, Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? So the NASB says this, Even so, consider yourself dead to sin. So really, I started this off talking about the Word of God. I talked about believing God and his word. And what this word is saying right here is this. God believes you're dead if you're a new creation. Because he wrote the book. And that's what he said. Whether you feel like it or not, whether you knew it or not before you got in here, I'm here to tell you, did you not know? Know ye not that those of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. You might not have known it before, but I hope you know it now after you leave here tonight that in the mind of God, the old man that you were born of Adam that was bound by sin is no longer the same person. You're a new man in Christ. Amen. That old passed away and behold, all things have become new. So if that's what God sees you as, praise God, then that's what we should see ourselves as. Yvette, maybe you could come forward. And as she's, or you know, the music team, I like always like to end on a with a with a with a song at least to give people an opportunity. Amen. If they feel led to to receive prayer, if they feel led uh, to spend a little bit of time at the altar, then I always want to I want to try my best to provide that opportunity for you. If you know, if not, then then service will be dismissed in just a moment, right? But
This is a little bit of a conclusion. The word of God proclaims that the old man was born naturally in Adam and that in that first birth, the old man was born under the power of sin. The word of God proclaims that when a person is truly converted, a miracle takes place. He becomes a new creation. The spirit of God now lives in him. The Holy Spirit has power to raise the dead, heal diseased bodies, perform creative miracles, and for tonight's message, destroy the power of sin. Believers believe. When believers believe, God blesses them. He gives them a gift. The gift tonight was righteousness. Righteous people receive grace. Grace is related to the power of the Holy Spirit. Sin cannot stand in the presence of the Holy Spirit.